the first thing to define with the toxic masculine is like, is he aware of the impact that he's having on the world? Like are his motives and intentions solely for his own kind of needs or desires or, and, or is he in relation to the environment around him or, and, or, you know, an intimate partner or friend. Namaste. You're listening to the Savannah Podcast. Join us on an exploration of Eastern spirituality, yoga philosophy, and conscious living for the new age. This podcast is a production of SavannahSpirit.com, where you can find a large selection of Om and yoga clothing, spiritual jewelry, and unique fair trade gifts from the Far East. Now here's your host, Ashton Subbo. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Savannah Podcast. We've got a great show in store for today. We're going to be talking all about presence and the sacred masculine and feminine. Our guest is my good friend, Johnny Blackburn. He holds a master's degree in psychology. He's a professional coach, speaker, and facilitator who empowers clients, organizations, and audiences to discover and live from their deepest presence. Excited to have him on the show today to talk with us. Johnny, welcome. Hey, Ashton. Thanks for having me, man. So we, uh, we actually go back quite a, a bit of a ways. And I think if, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but didn't we meet at a, a like a men's gathering that, that uh, our friend Kyle and I were putting on? Is that where we first met? I was thinking about that this morning. And I think it's been almost 10 years. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was one of the first few years I was back visiting from, from my travels. And uh, we had a, a God's gathering out in Julian, which was like a, a, a sort of a, a relaxed in the sense of you know organization, but a, a men's retreat, just a, a gathering of 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 men being men together, and it was it was quite awesome. And you actually uh, from that, you know, we've stayed in touch over the years. You actually came and visited me when uh, when I was out in Thailand, living out there. Uh, I got to see you for a while, and that was super fun. And we've just stayed in touch over the years. It's been great. Yeah, I was reflecting on all that, and uh, you know, I remember the some of the conversations we had around the fire uh, there in Julian, and I think. That's so primal, like men out in nature, like having deeper conversations around the fire. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that I really appreciated about you is, is sort of your embodiment and integration of like all parts, like the primal, the physicality, the like practical in the world, the, you know, the wisdom traditions across culture and like integrating spirituality and presence like into our daily lives. Well, it's definitely been um, my work and, and, and a big challenge for me just in my own life of learning how to integrate those things. So, uh, you know, I feel blessed that I can share any of that with anybody else because it's it's definitely been a, a challenging road for me throughout life. Uh, tell tell us about uh, about your background a little bit, uh, the work that you do and, and everything else. Yeah, I... I in terms of sacredness, like I think from a younger uh, child, like there was a, a bent and, and curiosity about life and bent towards spirituality. And um, I had a profound experience in 16 and started to kind of read different traditions. But I had, I remember in college, like this, I was kind of split. Like there was this one that was kind of conventional all American party guy. And then like on the side reading Buddhism and Lao Tzu and Hinduism, Christian mysticism. And it wasn't until a severe injury, uh, like towards the end of, of college, that uh, that pro very humbling four-year process, like it was through that that I, I kind of shifted my course, just kind of going down the track of management consulting, and that I was able to start to kind of integrate these worlds. And that, that sent me on a, a radically different quest in my 20s. Hmm. Now the, the the work that you do, you work a lot with with individuals. I've actually since since our you know initial gods gathering and whatnot that we've met, I've actually gone to what they would be called. I don't know if they're called uh, meetings or, or, or uh, what they are, but men's groups where that that you actually lead now, and that that's part of your work as well. And that was a phenomenal experience. Uh, we weren't around the campfire at that time, but we did some pretty exciting things as well. Tell us about some of that work. Yeah, I think. Um that we like developmentally there's certain things that need to happen maybe on a cushion or like in our own individuated process. And then I think there's a, another degree that, that happens in intimacy and relationship or friendship and one-on-one. -on -one. And then there's a whole nother dynamic that happens in group. And I'm fascinated with, with all of these. 
um, over the last, I think it's, this is year seven now, I've been doing men's groups. Um, and I love, like, there's something really special, whether it's around the fire or kind of like in that group container where we, like in the presence of others that we're able to see parts of ourselves and kind of express and know ourselves um, towards a, a like more embodied presence in our lives. And I, I love that stuff. And who would you say is, is uh, the biggest influence or one of the biggest influences in your life, in the work that you do? Oh, many. Um, really inspired by Thomas Hubel's work uh, around awakening intimacy. Really appreciate uh, David Data's work around um, kind of like awakening sexuality and, and intimacy as well. And he really, like, I really appreciate his um, clarity around gender dynamics. Um, so the group is kind of inspired by that as well as authentic relating, um, and mankind projects kind of like, uh, it's been influenced by a lot. And, you know, I think there's like, we have three or four groups we're going to, we just started, it's going to be three or four groups this round. And, you know, that in the emergent process of that, like that also that's a, a living experience that also evolves and, and deepens, um, but it's definitely like there's a really strong foundation by those kind of masters. I love this quote of like that we we lay like we stand on the shoulder of giants. And I think there's a really like that we can get into a mishmash of spirituality, but I without being biased by some of the like cultural biases from, you know, millennia past, like I think there's also a sweet spot of really honoring the traditions and honoring the masters. Well, I agree. And I think that's a, an important place where we're at right now of we've got access to so much and that can sometimes lead to uh, an inevitable kind of mishmash splooge of just stuff, uh, which doesn't really have any coherency to it. Um, but so I, I think it's important to honor the traditions themselves while at the same time recognizing that there's a there's an integration, there's a there's a, an, an, a digestion that needs to happen in our modern lives with any of that stuff to make it even that much more applicable to this modern living. So there is a, a blending happening, but uh, I think how we make it from, you know, just being a, a gray mush of, of different things is, is by honoring the tradition still most definitely. Now, you, you do a lot of work uh, with, with presence, um, you know, and we can, we can talk about sort of the, the languaging behind like masculine and, and feminine concepts and ideas. But I want to start just because with, with any word, it's important to recognize kind of where we're coming from definition wise. How do you define presence? Yeah, I think it's, it's a real nebulous concept. Eckhart Tolle, I think is um, has really pioneered the, not only the direct transmission, but also kind of the word um, in, in relationship to kind of the present, mo the totality of the present moment. In, um, in the corporate world, this is one of the, you know, three or four hottest things, executive presence. Um, and there's a few different kind of authors that have um, propagated this work. And I, you know, I think also it's nebulous, but it's tend to be a little bit more posturing and kind of ego based in this, but they're still like, so what is this presence? Like this, this is this, I have clients that come to me after their annual review and then their, you know, their supervisor said, okay, you know, we want you to work on your communication and, you know, some of your networking and organization. And we'd also work like you to work on your executive presence. And then the, the client asks, well, what's this? And the, bo the boss is kind of like vague. And they're just like, you know, you need to have your executive presence. And so they come in, you know, for a session and doing a program and they don't, again, this is a very nebulous thing. So my, as I've kind of like really been exploring this over the last number of years, my sense is that there's three features, like that presence has three faces. And I think one is a really powerful embodiment, like that we really powerfully inhabit our bodies. And this type of presence shows up in athletes and rock stars and, you know, yogis and kind of martial artists that have really been cultivating um, the inhabitation of their body. And then this shows up in the way that they enter a room or the way they kind of stand, walk, move through the world. So this first phase is embodiment. 
And I think there's a second phase of presence, which is, is related to connection or intimacy. And I think you might find this in a, um, an amazing healer or like a, a caring nurse or a really attuned mother or a deeply connected lover. So the second phase that of, quote, being present involves connection and intimacy. Because you could have like a powerful athlete in the room, but they're self-absorbed so that they're inhabiting their body powerfully, but they're not actually present to the space around them or interpersonally. And then I think the third phase of presence is kind of an awareness. And again, this gets tricky with the concept, but let's, let's define this as kind of the to, like a spaciousness or the totality of the present moment. Again, this is what spiritual teachers point to or what Eckhart Tolle points to. And so pre, like when somebody says be present, like what is it? It's not like a, an absolute thing. There's, there's a relative degree of presence and kind of the premise of the presence Academy is that by being deep, like cultivating deep embodiment and cultivating our capacity to be connected and in intimacy and expanding our awareness that these are ways that we can like enhance overall presence. Well, so we've got the, the, these ideas you're talking about the, the embodiment, the connection, the awareness as these sort of faces of presence, but, I'm curious, are you, when, when we're, we're using this concept in term and someone says, because you all said like, be present, are, are, we, are we drawing those out in the same space to say that to be more present is to have presence or is presence, because um, I mean, I could, I could be very comfortable in my body, um, I, I could be connected to others, um, maybe the awareness piece would be lacking, but you know, I could be thinking about tomorrow, yesterday, a million other days and not actually present in the moment, but still have a presence, right? Like I can walk into a room and people, or, or someone could walk into a room and people would be like, oh, wow, like that person is, is glowing. They've got such a presence, but that person's actually thinking about, you know, the fact that their car was just broken into and that their their relationship just ended and, and all these other sort of things. So where do those two things, um, uh, let's say collide or, or how are they separate? they're related and that that's the the premise is that it's presence is a spectrum and to say you don't say be present as like an absolute like a zero or a hundred percent but presence is a relative thing and it's comprised of these three faces of degrees of embodiment degrees of capacity for intimacy and degrees of spacious awareness and, and what would you say is the then the the biggest or or some of the biggest blocks to people being present so, you know, again, that each of these different components has uh, like bar doorways into or barriers. So first, let's talk about some of like, if you, if you don't mind, like I'd like to talk about some of the access points. Yeah. So I think, um, and, you know, you're going to find this in any yoga or uh, class that there's a real like breath is often one of the easiest access points to becoming quote more presence or increasing presence another one is kind of like the, being more grounded that we feel our legs and feet on the ground another one is emotional awareness oftentimes neuroscience out of ucla indicates the very act of naming an emotion helps to decrease the limbic emotional activation in our brain. So the very act of naming the emotion actually increases our awareness and presence of it. So those are three ways like sensing and progressively sensing and relaxing our body is another one. So breath grounding body awareness or emotional awareness. These are ways to increase like embodied presence. Now to increase like intimate connection, eye contact, is a simple one being uh, like that we're able to be more relaxed in our own body from some of the things I mentioned from embodiment this and the more quiet our mind is then the more available we are for connection so actually intimacy and connection with others starts with us being kind of more grounded and centered and relaxed in our own self but that said like listening or some of the principles of authentic relating, these are doorways into um, connect presence and connection. 
And then awareness um, are some of the more mindfulness related principles. Like Eckhart Tolle talks about um, silence as a gateway, talks about like radical acceptance, like accepting everything as it is. And I think the more that somebody um, cultivates their system, then the more access they can get to profound openness. Well, it's great because I, I was going to ask you some sort of practical ideas and stuff around all of this, and you basically listed some for, for each, which is awesome. And, and so if we can, I, I want to change gears a little bit, um, still kind of within the, the conversation of, of presence and people finding um, that or, or living from that, that deepest place of presence. You know, in the, in the, in the world today, uh, we're seeing a lot of examples of what we could define, I don't know if you would define it as this, but what we could define as toxic masculinity. So I, I want to take a moment just to, to first talk about that and then we can constantly draw it back through presence. But, you know, what would you, what would you say is, is toxic masculinity? What does that look like? Or if you have a particular word that, that you would use for it. Yeah, I think um, some people, I hear people say like the wounded masculine or um, the unconscious masculine. And um, there's like looking at the world through developmental lenses, like we, we see that there are, that all qualities exist on a spectrum. And so that you, you can't, that you can't have light without dark. I mean, I remember some beautiful conversations around the campfire 10 years on this. And so I think the first thing to define is like with the to toxic masculine is like, is he aware of the impact that he's having on the world? Like are his motives and intentions solely for his own kind of needs or desires or, and, or is he in relation to like the environment around him or, and, or like, you know, an intimate partner or friend. So I think one, one flavor is that the toxic masculine can um, use the, look at the environment and the world around him solely for the accumulation of resources, power, um, like that he's like a locust mm -hmm. to the world. Instead of like some of the, you know, indigenous traditions that they were an intimately a part of the world. And so they, they respected the cycle of life more. Well, I think we've grown up in a time where, you know, because there are so many examples of this, you know, however we choose to, to label it of, of toxic masculine or, um, you know, guys like David Data would use like first stage masculine. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. macho jerk. You know, like, yeah, right. The, the, the macho jerk, the, this, this 50s caricature of what masculinity is supposed to be like, I'm tough, I don't cry, I don't care about women unless they're for me, they're possessions, you know, like this, this kind of silly character, caricature. Um, and, and so it, it led us to then as, as men, because we all have masculine and feminine within us, but I, I noticed this with a lot of, of, of men growing up around similar age to me is that, you know, it was encouraged, okay, well, you need to be more feminine then because the masculine is, is somehow bad or dirty or it's what's wrong with the world. And so we have this whole generation of extremely sensitive men without any purpose, without any connection to their masculine because they were told the masculine is bad. But as you said, it's this spectrum of, you know, there are sort of the, the dark underbellies and the positive light sides of everything. So it's a matter of like, what are we cultivating? What are we encouraging? And you know, this is a conversation I've been having a little bit more on the podcast. I want to continue to have more because I think it's something that's really important and relevant right now of like, how, how do we cultivate and uh, how do we support a, a, a new masculine or let's say the, the, the positive masculine side for people in this day and age? Super passionate about that. Super passionate about that. And I'll, I'll touch on one other kind of toxic flavor of kind of objectifying the feminine or objectifying women. And I think part of the demasculinization comes out of that count as a counteraction. And a lot of times when there's a single mother or like a father who hasn't had like a model for his masculinity, then, then you can see a, a lot in this younger generation where they've lost, they, 
become defeminized, like they are not connected to their purpose. Their father hasn't reflected some of their gifts and strengths and helped them cultivate and hone that and given them their, their symbolic sword in the world. I think another thing is where um, integrating healthy aggression, integrating anger in a conscious way, integrating boundary and powers, integrating our sexuality, integrating our sense of unique purpose in the world. I think these are all um, areas of like reclaiming the, the healthy masculine and, and, and bring like that evolving it into its sacred form. How then does that relate to ideas of, of the sacred feminine? Because again, that can be for the, for that, uh, you know, to use that word, the first stage masculine again, the, the feminine as, as goddess is seen almost as a threat. Uh, and you see this a lot of people of, of a backlash to feminism that like um, it, it somehow feels that that to promote the feminine is to then put down the masculine, which in fair in some sense of fairness, that's what we've gotten at times. But that's not what it's all about. So how, how does the feminine play into a healthy, respectful experience of the masculine? Well, anytime we were seeing the world in either or. You know, I think that's a red flag. Mm -hmm. Everything exists in polarity and, and, uh, and on a spectrum. I want to I wanna just pause for a moment and see if we can kind of define some terms because, you know, I think a lot of people get caught up around concepts um, and they have concepts of what masculine and, and feminine are that like may or may be toxic and you, or they may be useful. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a difference between biology of like a male and male genitalia and, and, and male hormones, higher testosterone, and like a female with female genitalia and, and more female related hormones. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then masculine is an energy that, as you spoke to earlier on the call, that can animate a man or a woman. Now, it's man or sorry, a male or female it's man or woman, like what it means to be a man or what it means to be a woman. I think we have to most be careful of, because I think these are the things that are most loaded with cultural stereotypes, with familial stereotypes, with religious stereotypes, mm -hmm. but the pure energy of masculine and feminine. And I've been in a number of workshops as a, as a participant and facilitator where they separate men males and females on the either side of the room and without any instruction at all, it is fascinating to watch consistently, even with different cultures that how that these essential energies kind of amplify when they're together. Well, that, that's something that, I mean, it came as part of, you know, our, how we met with the God's gatherings and so much of the work that you do where, you know, I think, equality within social spaces is really important where, hey, everybody needs to be able to go, you know, to these different types of places. Um, so when we have, you know, like men's only clubs where women aren't allowed and so it's for the guys like there, there's there's issues with all of that. But there's also something really, really powerful and really important about men being just with men and women being just with women at times. Because the, the, the types of sharing that occurs, if you're in a group of woman, women and there's a man there, the sharing is going to be different than if the man wasn't there. And same the other way around. You know, men in a group together act a lot differently if there's one female, even if it's, you know, what we could say is a more masculine female. They, they just act differently. And so there's something, and a lot of indigenous cultures recognize this. There was certain levels of separation, at the very least during times of ritual for these types of things. And that's that's a whole other side of the topic is of the, the lack of ritual, whether they be masculine or feminine for men or for women, is we're missing ritual in our culture, which really helps to define the, the, how these things, these forces operate culturally within a particular culture. Totally. Totally. And I think that the, the, the extra important piece around like being together with, with men is that there's a quality of, of learning that, that, that happens in an embodied way when we're in the presence of others like that are, I think they call it neuroception, that when we're in the presence of someone else or mirror neurons, like we can kind of get, we can, um, you know, like that if you were, if you were taking a lesson with a tennis instructor, that if you're in the presence and you're able to um, be like have the mirror neuron experience, then you're going to be able to learn faster. Mm 
And so in the absence of a, a younger man uh, growing up and kind of not having the modeling from his father of what it like, what it's like to have a healthy integrated sexuality, to have a healthy integrated power while in relation and, and with moral impact on others around him to have, be able to own his anger and not have it come out as toxic, unconscious aggression to like, live in his power and his balls, but have his heart open that with the absence of that, like often men's nervous systems don't get those kind of like imprints so that it's ever important for them to kind of, you know, and being in the trenches for now seven years, like you see what happens over time when a man starts to surround himself with other men and that his nervous system can kind of learn and activate these inherent like latent potential parts of himself. This is in terms of, you know, taken out of concept, but like really in the trenches, creating embodied transformation, that stuff really uh, inspires me. Mm -hmm. when you, you mentioned role models. Who, like how, like we live in a culture right now where in America, in the West, where our role models tend to be celebrities. Most of them, their personal lives are utter messes. Um, you know, how, or the ones that, that tend to have a little bit more together tend not to be in the news. Um, like where, where do we either find our role models now? Are there people out there that you would encourage, you know, male listeners to, to, to look towards? Um, do we, is this, is this like, are we starting from scratch here and we need to create our models? Like, where do we go with this? Dude, we could do a whole other podcast on this. <laughs> And, you know, it's fascinating if you look at, if you look at films and I think the, the hero, the, 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 the hero warrior archetype in, 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 in stories or movies, I think this is the symbolic call for, you know, the hero's journey within and, and the guy finds his own unique purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think we're as well as integrating some of the healthier forms of embodied kind of competition and aggression that we, we, we disown. And then this becomes a shadow that we want to passively watch on the TV. But, and as much as it, it, that is important for many men, I think it's equally important that like, who's our ro other positive role models? Like, you know, you know, you know, as a father, I can think of like, uh, to kill a mockingbird in Atticus Finch. He's like epic father. <laughs> but other than that, man, a lot of the father, and I haven't watched TV in years, but you know, the, the, the fathers that are portrayed in sitcoms are like, this doesn't inspire me. <laughs> you know, who are our models of an integrated man in the 21st century? Well, and so who, who would you think that is like, or, or is this literally, do we like in the, perhaps the Hindu sense where you create a model um, where it's okay, here's an image this is the image, and this image has particular characteristics, and those characteristics help to explain um, certain aspects of this this figure, and that gives us our our guidance. Because again, like I said, I mean, th there aren't a lot of great models out there for us. Uh, you mentioned fatherhood. Like I don't, you know, my my father is a great father, um, great guy, wonderfully loving human being. But there's a lot about him that that I would sort of classify as falling into these older models of the masculine with things. And it's not like he's a fully integrated, you know, conscious walking being. He's, he's, he's a wonderful human being. I'm thankful that, that I, I have him as a father. He's taught me so much. Um, but, you know, I, I can't think of in my life of like a lot of other guys out there. Most of them are, are at the very least, like we're kind of struggling along together and trying to figure it out together, which is also really important and in its own sense, a role model. But there's no one that we can really point to and be like, yes, like that is that is the example of the male that we need. And in the media, I'm sure people like that exist. We don't get those, though. We get the ones that are that old toxic masculine again coming out and creating controversy and dividing people and upsetting people. And that's that's what we get. And I, I just get so so I get frustrated, but I'm also really curious, inspired, like, how do we change that model? How do we shift the interest towards uh, the, the sacred masculine? This is such an incredible point, Ashton. My sense is there's two faces to it. One, the, 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 the conventional media piece or conventional cinema. 
and, and TV. And I think that this is appealing more to the masses. And so they're, they're casting roles where the, you know, I, I I have only heard snippets, but I've heard that there's a very like limited mindset within kind of the movie industry. And like, there's a whole formula of like how a movie has to be and that they, they have all these assumptions of that, that the masses won't get it. And, you know, Epic movies like the fountain, you know, that actually had a good budget doesn't do well because people don't get it. So I think on one level, like people want to watch stuff that they resonate with. And I think there's a part of the mind that likes drama so I think this is one face that you don't really see a lot of, like, I think we're craving and I, I'm curious how long it takes, but where we get a movie with uh, a male, like an integrated evolutionary man, like, I think that would kill it. <laughs> well, what, what's interesting along those lines though, too, is that yes, there, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting waiting too. I mean, I'm not going to hold my breath, but I'm waiting for that, that story to be told of, of an integrated, especially perhaps modern man. But that being said, when, and you mentioned Joseph Campbell earlier, I mean, when you, you get into the work of guys like Campbell and, you know, his sort of epic book of the, the hero with a thousand faces, and you start to understand archetypes more. I mean, we sit down, like we don't have TV, but we do watch a lot of movies in my family. And you know, my daughter will sit with us and watch movies. We, you know, we, there's certain movies we don't watch with her. But um, we, we talk about the, the story and the journey and the characters and what they represent and be like, oh, why did that happen? Because most stories, whether it's in completely intentional or unintentional, they're still working with that formula. They might, as you mentioned, kind of simplify things for 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 mass consumption, but the, the, the stories underlining them are still there. All it takes is looking. I mean, we can look at a movie like the matrix and everyone can say, okay, there's an obvious philosophy here. Um, but most people don't take it much further than, well, it's red pill, blue pill. It's all an illusion. Okay. Are we living in a matrix? Are we living in a computer simulation? That's really deep. And that's it. But I mean, there are, I mean, there are literally books written on the philosophy of, of the matrix. Um, it's coming from all kinds of different philosophy. Like you can go way deeper into all of these things. And that's, that's something that I think is missing from our education of like, okay, sure. We're a media culture. We can, uh, we're not going to stop consuming media anytime soon, but understand one, the impact of that media and two, like the, the underneath side of all of that media of like, what is it really getting at? Like if you see a commercial, is it inspiring the best out of you? Or is it like getting you to feel less than to buy something? When you see characters, are you watching like, you know, the story of, of an epic struggle between like of a, of a human being finding their purpose and overcoming odds? Or is it just like, ridiculous entertainment where yes, you've got a task getting completed each time, but is there any real depth to the story at that point? Yeah. Like does Superman really need to destroy New York city? <laughs> right. Like are the, we really yeah. need to evolve the, the movie there. I'm waiting for that. The second, the second face in the point that I was going to bring up is, you know, my sense is, is that this is more of a, like in terms of a local tangible flavor, it's more of a grassroots thing where, you know, like that somebody goes to Ashton's yoga class and a male is like that he does, may be conscious or not, but he really is drawn to and attracted to and respects this this man and his embodiment and, and the wisdom that comes through him and his power and his open heart. Or that somebody seeks out a coach as a mentor or somebody joins a men's group where they're around other like men that are becoming integrated. So I think when you say, how do we change it? Like for now, I think it starts off on a grassroots level that you find out men that inspire you and have integrated certain qualities. And then in being in their presence, then your nervous system can increasingly activate that. And the second thing is on a, on a larger mass thing that I think video, whether it's cinema or just like people doing YouTube videos, uh, I think this is going to start to be a way that we're also getting examples of kind of the evolutionary masculine. Mm -hmm. So to kind of tie it back to our original topic, how does having a, a greater understanding of these, these energies of the masculine and feminine, how does it help us to be more present in our lives? 
first of all, I want to honor, like I used to love your yoga classes, man, because it, there was such, um, like there was a, an openness and a levity in the midst of kind of like, you know, focus practice. And so, so I love this this integration, and I also love some of the wisdom uh, and the pointers, like the reminders that kind of were spoken through you, no, to in, always integrate this into our life. And to to your question, oftentimes understanding and conceptualization is the first kind of step. That wow, we have a new awareness and we see something, hear something, read something, and then we start to like think cognitively about this. Ultimately, this is the process of embodied learning. That no, this that the mind is quiet, and then we don't even need to speak it, but it's embodied. And then we're walking through the world, and somebody feels this, or that that in in life, then a situation presents itself, and in a, like martial arts or aikido way, that like. No, because this quality, this masculine quality is embodied, then, then it res- there's a re- effortless responsiveness. So to your question, like first conceptual reading books, um, I would recommend David Data's The Way of the Superior Man mm-hmm. and Robert Augustus Masters To Be a Man mm-hmm. as really books that are kind of talking about the integrated evolutionary masculine. And then I would, I would advise people to actually seek out uh, a coach that inspires them or, and or men's groups and or a yoga or martial arts uh, teacher that that they like they respect their embodied masculine presence so that in interacting with them and reading and learning that they increasingly learn how to embody these these like essential qualities into their life well, I think you know we we are we're definitely keeping a a, f- a focus on the masculine, which you know is kind of a pun if you recognize how we're using the conversation of, of the masculine. Um, but but with the with the feminine as well, I mean that's that's a whole other topic of. I mean, and it fits in very much to the, this collection of the the sort of three faces of presence that you mentioned, where you know there's there's a very physical in the body connected experience to be had. And that's, you know, I see a lot of that in this, the, what you call the, the embodiment or the, in the intimacy or connection side. But there's also that awareness side, which is the, the capacity to lift yourself above it and to witness it all without being in it. Like, and that, that adds a, a perspective where you can actually see things that you can't see when you're in it. And that's, that's how we're, we're using these terms masculine and feminine of this, this capacity of like energy, shakti, um, and perspective, uh, you know, consciousness, witnessing itself. And those kind of can feed together for, for presence. Uh, and I think that, you know, as we've mentioned already, we all have feminine and masculine in us already. So yes, you might be a, um, a male, you might be a female. All these concepts still can apply. Uh, if, you're, if you're a woman, you might not be looking up men's groups uh, anytime soon. But at the very least, like starting this conversation out there, I think for, for women too, like we can't fully help to support the feminine until we've integrated the masculine. And I, I'm speaking that from the perspective of a man. Like we can't really start r- truly and authentically approaching issues of the feminine and feminism until we as men have figured out what the heck we're doing. And that, that's an important thing because I feel like culturally sometimes we're trying to bypass that as well. It's like we need to talk about the importance of the feminine, which, I mean, we absolutely need to do. But from the perspective of the masculine, we got to sort our own crap out before we start doing that. I think that might be perhaps why some of this draw and resistance to some of that is, is because they're like, ah, I'm not, I'm not done with what the work I got to do here. How can I start going on to that? So it's, it, you know, it, it's a complex and, and ever evolving conversation. Um, That's a great point, Ashton. Say more. <laughs> well, well, I, I want to, you know, we, we gotta, we gotta actually start ending the, the episode here, but act, my, my thought here is, well, we can save that one perhaps for another episode as it's one that I, I definitely, uh, I like to, to dive into this conversation more. I think, uh, this is an area within the podcast that we will be 
discussing a lot more. It's a conversation I want to have a lot more this year because in particular, I think, it, you know, before this year, it was a very important and vital conversation, period. I think after this year, given the examples we have in the world right now of the toxic masculine, um, from a disconnection from things, a, a lack of intimacy from the environment and others and a sensitivity towards other people's feelings and needs, like this is a conversation that needs to be happening in the world right now. So I'm, I'm happy to bring you back on the show again to uh, perhaps continue this conversation or start new ones, um, but I definitely want to have this conversation more. Where can people find out about you and, and all the work that you do? I know you got a lot of really awesome projects locally in San Diego. You got your men's groups, but you do stuff online. Tell us, tell us about your work and where we can find out about it. Personal site is Johnny, www.johnnyblackburn.net. Um, you can find out information about personal coaching and, and men's work locally in San Diego. Um, Nationally, internationally, www.presence.academy, which is an online training program um, for thriving and work-loving life, integrating presence and connection skills. It's a, it's a video-based kind of gamified um, training program that's really fun, and I'm, I'm super excited about that. Awesome. Well, and I, I'd like to, to just give everybody as well, in particular, any men that are listening to the show, especially if you're in San Diego, um, you know, not only do I, I, I've known you well and we've had ongoing conversations through our friendship over the years, but I, having been to that experience of the men's group that you put on and, and what a, a great facilitator of that space that you are and the, the power in that that type of meeting, I really encourage people to go. If you're not in San Diego, find those types of things in your own or create them yourselves. I imagine, Johnny, you're a good resource too for, for people that might want to start things like that up. You'd be a great person to talk to on how to facilitate some of that stuff because uh, you know we, we, we need this conversation to be had in the world today. So I, I really appreciate the work that you do, man. Thank you, man. Yeah, I just want to say it's a rich topic and ever more poignant in in the world, you know, in the last number of months and in the coming years. Yeah. I've had two conversations um, just the last two weeks with men starting men's groups in their area, and I'm super inspired by that. I want to just say for men it, not in the San Diego area, a couple good resources to, to get started. You could go to a David Data workshop, finding on information online, D-A-V-I-D. D E I D A or authentic relating has a, a powerful intro weekend that I think is really empower powerful for kind of learning um, like evolutionary relating skills. And the third thing is I recommend many men do uh, the new warrior training as part of the mankind project. You can find any of these three. Awesome. Love it. Thanks, man. Always, always appreciate the resources. Love the, the couple of books that, uh, that you mentioned as well, because I think that's really important. And uh, as, as a quick note, obviously, this will all be uh, your website and everything will be in the uh, show notes. But uh, it's Johnny, J-O-H-N-N-Y, not uh, J-O-N-N-Y or anything else. Uh, but that, of course, will be written in the, the description and show notes. Johnny, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm sure for everyone listening out there that they've they've learned something. I hope that they're inspired to want to continue this conversation in their own lives. Thank you all so much for listening today, and I hope you have a very present moment. Namaste. Hey, everybody. It's Ashton here with an announcement. We're starting a weekly contest giveaway over at Savannah Spirit. If you'd like to enter into the contest to win one of our weekly prizes, go to savannahspirit.com slash contest. If you enjoyed listening to the podcast today, we'd really appreciate it if you went over to iTunes, left us a review, leave us some comments, and share this podcast with anyone who you think might enjoy it. Also want to invite you to go check out Savannah East, which is the name of our blog and also the name of a Facebook group where I interact with guests and our audience. We'll post recent episodes up there as well as interesting articles relating to our guests and or the topics on the shows. And again, thank you so much for listening. Namaste.
You've been listening to the Savannah Podcast. To find out more about Savannah, go to savannahspirit.com or follow Savannah on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Savannah Spirit. For daily inspiration, check out our blog at savannaheast.com. Be sure to join us next week for a new episode. And thank you for listening to the Savannah Podcast.